We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. About a year ago, when I first submitted a list of possible episodes for this podcast to my producer, he pointed out one admission. He said, I don't see how you can do a podcast called Truly the Goats and not have Muhammad Ali in there. Fair enough. Just one problem. What new can you say about Muhammad Ali? At one time, the most famous personality, never mind athlete, in the world. About a man known as much for bold political stance as his amazing feats in the ring. About probably the only athlete in modern sports history to justifiably proclaim himself a goat. I am the greatest. Even non-sports fans have heard the fundamentals of Muhammad Ali's story, but let's go through the early years quickly. In 1960, then going by his birth name, Cassius Clay, he burst into international consciousness by dominating the light heavyweight class at the 1960 Olympics, easily taking the gold medal. Cassius scoring well with his lightning left jab, and every once in a while, confusing Pietrakowski with a right lead. Clay, at 18, has been boxing for six years. In over 130 amateur fights, he has lost only once. Even now, in his hometown of Louisville, Kentucky, he is a well-known celebrity. In the quarterfinals of this country... In 1961, Cassius Clay publicly announced his conversion to Islam and a change of name to Muhammad Ali. Why do you insist on being called Muhammad Ali now? That's the name given to me by my leading teacher, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. That's my original name. That's a black man named Cassius Clay was my slave name. I'm no longer a slave. I want to be called by that name. I write autographs of that name. I want to be known all over the world as that name. In 1964, Ali won the world heavyweight title, beating Sonny Liston by TKO in seven rounds. That cut close. Uh, do you feel as though Sonny is being busted up a little bit, puffed up a little bit around the face? Just prior to this fight, he had proclaimed his immoral catchphrase and would come to be known for his distinctive mode of speaking. I am the greatest. Fifteen times I've told the crowd what round he's going down, and this stuff ain't no different. You're falling in to prove that I'm great. And if you keep talking jab, I'm gonna tell you the fact. And after that first fight against Liston, Ali doubled down on his already all-in stance, saying, and I know I can't do an Ali quote justice, but I don't have the audio for this one. I am the greatest thing that ever lived. I don't have a mark on my face, and I upset Sonny Liston, and I just turned 22 years old. With the championship title win, Ali's record at the professional heavyweight level rose to 21 wins, 0 losses. In 1965, Ali defended his title, beating Liston in under two minutes. Clock, 1 minute 53 seconds, was 10 seconds after Liston hit the camp. Walcott leaves the fighters, Liston still has reflexes, look at him duck. Now Walcott has gotten information that Liston was down for a count of 10 and more. And so the fight is over and Muhammad Ali is still the champion in a scene of bedlam, chaos and confusion. In 1966, Ali was drafted into the U.S. military, but emphatically stated he would not serve in protest of the Vietnam War as a conscientious objector. My conscience won't let me go shoot my brother or uh, some darker people or uh, some poor hungry people in the mud for big powerful America and shoot them for what? They never called me n****. They never lynched me. They didn't put no dogs on me. They didn't rob me of my nationality. 
for rape and kill my mother and father. What I'm going to shoot them for what? How can I go shoot them? Them little poor little black people, little babies and children and women. How can I shoot them poor people? I'll just take me to jail. After defeating Zora Foley in March 1967, Ali had defended the title nine times to bring his career professional heavyweight record to 30 and 0. By June of that year, he'd been brought to court on charges of draft evasion and found guilty. Though naturally, Ali's legal representation immediately filed for appeal. The boxing authorities stripped him of his heavyweight title, and he would not be granted a license to fight anywhere in the U.S. until October 1970. But here's the thing. During that three and a half years officially away from the sport, Muhammad Ali did participate in one heavyweight fight. And not just any fight. The first ever time-bending, dream-fulfilling fight designed to determine the greatest heavyweight fighter of all time. The super fight. Now this is the story for Truly the Goats. My name is Oz Davis, and this is Truly the Goats, sports history as told through its superstars. Muhammad Ali last fight in a heavyweight match in 1981, meaning that basically no one under the age of 45 can remember him in anything like his prime. Speaking as one who does remember at least the tail end of Ali's boxing career, it's fascinating to watch the morphing of reputation from all-time great superstar to living legend to straight-up myth. Ali was not just the first athlete in American sports to have been widely acknowledged as a GOAT, even while still active in the sport, as we've seen in episodes on Jim Thorpe and Babe Didrikson and Zaharias. But he was certainly the first to call himself such. And kids who caught his act every few months on Wild World of Sports or Sky Sports or a hundred other broadcasters in the world, we believed it. And folks of my parents' generation were as drawn to Ali's charisma outside the ring and what we would today call his athleticism inside the ring. His footwork was like nothing that had been seen before, and he fought with flair. The only way one could deny his greatness was to take exception to his stance against the Vietnam War or his religion. Here are a few paragraphs from an editorial by Arizona Daily Star sports editor Abe Shannon in December 1969, reflecting a not-at-all-uncommon take on Ali. Cassius Clay, or Muhammad Ali as he prefers to call himself, is a great talent. There is little doubt that he is the best boxer on the scene, the best heavyweight in the world today. If some greedy promoter succeeds in finding a fight site and Clay goes up against Joe Frazier, I believe Cassius will come away the winner. But he will not, as far as I'm concerned, come away a champion. He simply does not carry the attributes of a champion. If Clay objected to going into military service because he believed the Vietnam War to be unjust or said he is a conscientious objector to all fighting, I could understand him better. But how can you understand a man who says his religion is against fighting and then announces he is ready to jump into a prize ring and batter an opponent into unconsciousness? Can you find a more hypocritical attitude? But today... Among those who weren't around when he was, Ali is well more fondly remembered for his political, cultural, and religious stances, which are well more in line with the mainstream 50 years later. But the opinion that he's the greatest ever is far more of a hard sell. For this episode of Truly the Goats, I sought the perspective of two podcasters who are into boxing history and or sports history to find what remains of Ali in the public consciousness. First, I spoke with Simon Walters, co-host of the You Don't Play Boxing podcast. Simon, thanks for joining us on Truly the Goats today. Thanks for having me. Okay, let's just get right into it. You're not quite old enough to have seen Ali when he was active. So what is your relation to Ali and uh, what have you seen of him? Gosh, I've seen a lot of him. I suppose I've just gone and searched him out, really. Not that you have to search that hard with Ali. He's been on so many films and so many, bi- you know, the Will Smith biopic. You know, I've always gone and, and looked for him. And in the UK, he's, he's very famous for his, his fight with a guy called Henry Cooper. I don't know if you've heard of Henry Cooper. Henry Cooper was the first guy, I think, to knock Ali down. And everybody thought he was going to be a big shock. And he put Ali down. And then 
Ali got up and, and beat him. And Henry Coop was very, he was, um, he was very well liked in the UK. He was sort of everybody's favourite sort of granddad type of character. And, and yeah, from there, and I've always gone and searched out a lot of boxing history. I think there was a there was a film that I, I really enjoyed. I think sort of when I was in university, it was called When We Were Kings. Oh yes, oh yes. And then from there, really, I, I realised sort of what a character he was, how how good he was, and I've always sort of looked at him and, and, and watched him a lot since then. And funnily, the other day, we, I, were, I run a, a podcast much like yourself called. Um, you don't play boxing with a good friend of mine, Anson Wainwright, who he was a, a, he's a writer for the Ring magazine. Um, and we had a we had an interview recently, and we had Muhammad Ali's son on the on the on the uh, on the podcast. So that was that was really interesting. He had a few good stories to reminisce about his dad, and also and also the guy that that trained him for a while as well. To someone who may not understand boxing very well, um, what was so special about Ali? What did he bring to heavyweight boxing? He was just, uh, it was the charisma, wasn't it? It was the charisma and I think the stand that he took around the Vietnam War as well, you know, it, it, it polarized him at the time. But when you look back at how... He was charismatic, but he also had, you know, he kind of had moral fiber, didn't he? He was just what every boxer would want to be. That guy that could, um, that could use boxing to sort of elevate other causes and other things. And he was just, sometimes, you know, he wasn't that nice. I remember him being, you know, he wasn't that nice to George Foreman when he was in the, in his fights. But afterwards, he was always, you know, he was always great friends with all the other. And I, I just think that, he was able to go on and, and express himself so well. And, and, you know, he talked so well. He, he was always very famous in the UK for some talk shows that he did. Oh gosh, it was the, it was the chap that he, I'll just check now. But he was massive in the UK, you know, and, and, and he was able to come over here, Michael Parkinson. That's what he did. He did a number of interviews with Michael Parkinson. You mentioned uh, President Nixon there. I was reading a piece that Norman Mailer wrote about you where, recently where he described you as the second most prominent American, second most prominent after Nixon. We might dispute that. But would you like to, to be president? No. No? No, sir. Too dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> like, in other words, here's a ship. People are dancing on the ship. A lot of money's on the ship. A lot of food's on the ship. And I cannot integrate on the ship. I cannot have equality on the ship. I'm just in the galley working. And I never could get up and see the captain of the ship. Now, all of a sudden, the man tells me, uh, say, come on down, I'll lead out of the galley. I want you to come up here and here, have something to drink. What do you want? And giving me number one spot. From the galley to the number one spot, I said, this ship must be sinking. Why is he, <laughs> Why is he so nice to me now? What moved him to call me up here? Black men have been males now. One might be the president. America's in too much trouble. I don't want that job now. <laughs> Watching him was just captivating. You know, he, 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 I know he had all the lines, you know, sting like a bee and float like a butterfly and all this kind of stuff. But he was just, he was just wonderful to watch, wasn't he? He was just so charismatic. And I think everybody that, um, everybody that's a fan of boxing was, was just a fan of Ali. And, and even, and even when he was ill towards the end, you know, he was still able to, you, you watch all of the you watch any fighters any any world you know world champions when they meet when they were meeting Ali they were like kids you know they were just everybody looked up to him so much and yeah just just incredible really for him to go through that much you know when you think that he had his, 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 his you think he had his titles taken away from him because he wouldn't fight in Vietnam and then to go back and win them is just you know just just a just amazing story really. Dan Newman. I also spoke Old with Sports, a member of the Sports History Network of Podcasts. Hey, thanks for joining us today on Two of the Goats. No problem. Glad I could do this. Really looking forward to it. As a sports history guy, what's your experience of Muhammad Ali? What have you seen of him? You know, I've seen bits and pieces of a lot of his fights, whether it's the three fights with Frazier, Liston, Foreman, uh, you know, Thriller Manila, Patterson, uh, ESPN on their uh, 
ESPN Plus service has a really good repository of old boxing, and it has pretty much every big Ali fight that you could imagine on there. So I've watched parts or all of a lot of his bigger fights. And then beyond that, just sort of remembering him as one of these guys who was just a living legend, uh, you know, growing up in the 80s and the 90s. I remember very vividly in 1996 when in Atlanta, when he lit the Olympic torch and just sort of remembering him sort of along the same lines as a uh, a Mickey Mantle or a, a Michael Jordan, that type, just sort of, and I obviously I remember Jordan as a player, but, you know, just sort of a living legend among athletes. But different from those guys in the social consciousness arena. Yeah, he kind of combined a few different things. You had a lot of the black athletes of the 60s were – active in civil rights. Uh, Bill Russell comes immediately to mind. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was another one, obviously, before that, Jackie Robinson. But Ali sort of combined a social conscience with two other things. First of all, he was just so much of a public figure. He was so articulate that he was able to express his views much more so than a lot of these other guys did. I think the fact that he was a boxer and that's an individual sport as opposed to a team sport played a large role in that. And then beyond that, Ali was somebody, unlike a lot of these others, who actually had to pay the price uh, in a real tangible way for his views on the events of the day. He, As you know, he was stripped of the heavyweight title for not serving in Vietnam and missed three years of his career, what would have really been three prime years of his career. So you can really, when you look at Ali and you look at his his activism and his social conscience, you can really see where he paid the price for the stands that he took. It was for arguments about the all-time heavyweight fighter that radio producer Murray Warner was inspired to create the first ever tournament to determine the GOAT through mathematics and technology. As Warner explained to UPI reporter William Verrigan in 1968, The idea started one night after I'd spent a couple of hours listening to arguments about what fighter were the best, who would have done what to whom. I asked a friend who works for a computer company whether a tournament couldn't be arranged if data were obtained on the fighters. He said it could be done, and we were on our way. Warner consulted with boxing writers and other experts to compile a list of 16 all-time great boxers and arranged them into a tournament bracket. Blow-by-blow account of each fictional match was created from the data generated in NCR 315, latest in the famed NCR 300 series. The Century 300 is the awaited, promised, newest, and by definition, the most advanced member thus far of the NCR Century Series of computer systems, designed to meet the new challenges of the new circumstances of our age. The 300 is for online, real-time users. The 300 is for multi-programming users. Computerized! From the magic city, the sun and fun capital of the world, Miami, Florida, through the incredible speed of the NCR 315 computer, Warner Productions proudly presents the all-time heavyweight championship tournament. Warner, together with boxing announcer Guy LeBeau, supplied the commentary and the tournament's living participants were interviewed to add further color and analysis for 15 radio shows that were broadcast on 380 radio stations across America. Tens of millions listened to the broadcast, most compelled by the exciting, realistic-sounding action. However, one listener was not amused, Muhammad Ali. The computer had determined that James Jeffries would beat Ali at the second round. Muhammad Ali in a close post-match. 
Ali sensed that the mythical loss to a boxer he called history's clumsiest, most slow-footed heavyweight, and perhaps inspired by his recent legal battles against the government, brought a suit against Warner, alleging defamation of character. Warner got inspired again. He settled the case with Ali by instead agreeing to pay him $10,000 if he participated in the filming of a stage fight between the only undefeated heavyweight champions ever, himself and Rocky Marciano. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of the PigskinDispatch.com, and I'm here to tell you about the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch, which is a podcast that covers the anniversaries of gridiron events throughout history on a day-to-day basis through the football history headlines. As bonus coverage each day, the legends of the Pro and Football Halls of Fame are remembered on the anniversaries of their birth, and their careers are highlighted in tribute to what they brought to the gridiron. Please join us daily on the Sports History Network, PigskinDispatch.com, or your favorite podcast provider to bring you the memories of the gridiron one day at a time in the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch Podcast. And now this all-time heavyweight championship fight ready to go. There's the bell, and here's Guy LeBeau. Rocky Marciano, Muhammad Ali, Cassius Clay, and this the classic championship fight. The super fight was filmed at a Miami soundstage in 1969. Marciano had dropped about 40 pounds, readopted his workout regime, and wore a hairpiece for the match. Over the course of about a week, Warner's crew of 22 filmed about 200 minutes worth of sparring, plus seven possible endings, with each fighter winning by knockout, TKO, and decision, plus a split decision. These were edited down to an 84-minute film, which showed for one night only in January 1970. Apparently back then, nothing could prevent sports writers and film goers from revealing spoilers. And speaking of spoilers... If you're interested in seeing the Super Fight spoiler free, you'll want to skip the next 10 minutes, 15 seconds of this podcast, as Dan and I will be talking about the entire Ali vs. Marciano match. So get ready to move on now. Let's talk the Super Fight then. So you have the DVD. Which is not not exactly widely available. Um, You can still get it on eBay. And in fact, there's still a version of the fight in and of itself on YouTube. Um, Tell me, please, before we get started in the actual super fight itself, what's on the DVD? So the first disc is just it's really two things. It's the fight, the Marciano Ali fight. And then there's a documentary about the making of the fight. And then there are also some some discussions on the second disc. There's the uh, the original trailer for the theater, you know, the theater trailer, because this was first shown in the theater. And there's some some interviews with um, people on the more um, the computer side of it. The coolest thing on the DVD of the bonus features, other than the documentary, which is just really cool. And I should say, if you only have time to watch one, either the whole fight or the documentary, watch the documentary because a good chunk, I would say half to two thirds of the fight is also included as part of the documentary. And there's also a lot of backstory, but the other cool thing that they have is radio plays of the other cool. Yes. They have all 15 fights that were in the radio tournament. The ones that aired on the radio, they have all 15 of those on the bonus nice. disc. Now, the finals in that was Marciano versus was it Lewis? It was Marciano Dempsey. Dempsey. Okay, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, he might be in the conversation as well. What was your take on this production as a film and as a fight? I thought it was really cool. Uh it was the type of thing where if you're watching it and you're sort of doing what I did, which was You know, I had it on and I was watching, but then every few minutes I'd look away to answer an email or look up something, whatever. You wouldn't realize unless you were staring right at it that these two guys were not actually punching each other. And in fact, in the documentary, that's what they talk about is that in a lot of ways they pulled the punches, but maybe they didn't pull them all the way. And there was a little bit of in fact, at one point, Ali actually demanded extra money because he thought he was taking more of a beating from 
Marciano <laughs> than he had than he had signed up for. It. It, it wasn't entirely clear whether he actually got that money or not, but he asked for it. So I thought it was really good. It, you know, it, it's dated. It's it's done in a way that it's clearly something from the late 1960s. But for that time, it really is a good production. And they have, um, you know, Marciano is interviewed, uh, you know, as part of sort of the pre-show. And the, the interview with him is very clear. And he's very well-spoken and very, you know, very um, – What's the word I'm looking for? He, he's very good at explaining his perspective on Ali and on this project and all of that type of thing. So it's really good. The announcing is great. The announcing sort of makes you feel like you're watching or listening to a boxing match from the 40s or 50s, which I think is what they were going for. So it really is. It's for the time. It is really well produced. And I think the most important thing is, first of all, it looks real. It, it's more realistic in a lot of ways than a lot of movie boxing scenes that you might see. And then also they both look like fighters. Marciano lost, I think, 50 pounds in preparation for this. He got a new toupee, so he would look the way he looked when he had been heavyweight champion. So you really – you could fool some people with this. It really does look real and sound real. I think it's interesting that you um, said it was dated because, yeah, I had seen this thing a couple of times before, and I went back and watched it in preparation for this interview. But, um, you know, I had seen it before 2020. And you look at this thing. So it's two guys, right? <laughs> There's, <laughs> okay, know you know where I'm going with this. with this, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, empty arenas. Right. There's a gray background. The crowd is piped in as a sound effect and you've got the announcers sounding as though everything is normal to me it looked <laughs> like it looked like a 2020 boxing match honestly in that respect in that respect i would be very surprised if when everybody was knocking their heads racking their brains trying to think about how they were going to do this aspect of the game you know, basketball and baseball, I would be shocked if they didn't go back to this thing yeah. and say, how did they do it? You know, because it's pretty good. Actually, it's better than the first 20 games of Major League Baseball this year, <laughs> in my opinion. It but you're down on baseball anyway, so. Well, yeah, but they really mucked it up in the first few weeks of the season. They definitely did. Let me ask you this, because for me, I think nowadays this would be the most controversial aspect of the movie is, is the alternate ending on the DVD? It is. Okay. What do you make of that? What, what is your opinion and, and which ending do you like better? I think I like the, mm, that's a good question. I think I probably like the Marciano ending only because I know that that was the real ending hmm. and the alternate was the alternate. And there were several alternates, is my understanding, that were yes. filmed. And the one that's on the DVD is the one where Ali wins by knockout in the 13th round is the one that's sort of considered the quote unquote alternate. But there were actually several alternates involving de decisions and TKOs and everything else. I thought that they were both very well done. I think it's easy for the Ali one to seem more realistic because even with Marciano's efforts to look younger, Ali clearly is the one who's, first of all, he's bigger, and then he's clearly in better shape, So, just based on his age. And so I think aesthetically I like the Ali ending, but I do think that I'm glad that they went with the actual ending that the computer – that the computer determined was the correct one, even if there were flaws to the computer system. I'm glad that they didn't fudge it just for the sake of what would be more dramatic. Really? See, I almost wonder if they did fudge it a little bit because, okay, so going into the 13th, they're tied on points. Yes. And how anticlimactic would that have been to have gone the full 15 and then had a referee decision? You don't want that. You film that ending. They even filmed a draw, which I don't really think they ever would have let stand. Although, on the other hand, that gives opportunities for the sequel. <laughs> 
because that's the you know the whole thing was started from settling arguments. Mm-hmm. Right? Murray Warner, that's what he started with is let's settle an argument, and you know to yeah. end it with a no decision would have been fantastic. Ali may have famously joked that the computer must have been made in Alabama. But directly after watching a screening of the fight in Philadelphia, he told reporters, Now I'm going to read tomorrow's headlines and go hide. They have destroyed my image. And five years later, in his autobiography, The Greatest, My Own Story, Ali put an even darker spin on the project. I saw myself on the ropes being destroyed by Marciano in one of the artistic endings few actors could equal. But some people thought it was real. Some sat stone still, some booed and yelled, some cried. I felt like I had disappointed millions all over the world. It left me ashamed of what I had been doing. As for Marciano, he had died in a plane crash just about three weeks after finishing filming. He never knew that once again, he'd won a championship match between goat heavyweights. Or had he? In a retrospective piece on the Superfight by Don Stradley for The Ring magazine, the publication whose editors and writers had been so involved with Warner's productions, a bit of the ultra-secretive veneer of the project was rubbed off. There also has been much conjecture as to how much the fighters knew. Warner supposedly told them that he didn't know how the NCR 315 would call the fight, so he wanted to shoot every possible ending. According to Mike DeLisa, who directed a 2005 documentary on the infamous computer fight as part of a double-disc DVD release, Warner knew Marciano was going to win, but told no one. Though many believe that Marciano died without knowing how the movie turned out, his family assured one of his biographers, Everett Skihan, that Warner had told Marciano that he'd win in the 13th. It's highly possible that Marciano only agreed to take part because he knew from the beginning that he was the winner, and that the various endings were filmed to string Ali along. The multiple endings led to a rumor that Ali was victorious in showings overseas, which Delisa derides as absolute myth. The urban legend that Warner had used different endings depending on what city the movie was being shown in was equally unfounded. An additional anecdote was that the NCR 315 was exposed as less than reliable. Prior to Joe Frazier bombing out Bob Foster in two rounds, Warner's favorite machine had allegedly selected Foster to win in six. Regardless, the 1969-1970 period was an era of new technological marvels, including the Boeing 747 jumbo jet and American astronauts on the moon. A computer picking the winner of a fight was plausible, which gave the super fight no less schlocky appeal than computer dating, which was hot back then, too. So even directly after the super fight, and even more so a half century later, boxing facts are left to subjective opinions on the question of the GOAT heavyweight. I don't know if boxing fans have these kind of debates about the GOAT. Is there any debate in boxing? Constantly. Constantly. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, like you wouldn't believe. Who who would compare with Ali then in, in an all-time tournament? In terms of in terms of another heavyweight, sure. Um, Joe Lewis, uh, Rocky Marciano always gets compared quite a lot because he went he went unbeaten. Joe Lewis was would have been up there. Um, I suppose you know modern day. You know everybody loves Tyson, but he wasn't as yeah. consistent as 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 Ali was. Um, Lennox Lewis was was. You know, fantastic. But yeah, maybe maybe Joe Lewis, maybe Marciano. And then, and you know, you can go, you can keep going further back, can't you? You can go back in time and look at, you know, people like Jack Dempsey and um, Floyd Patterson and people like that who were also fantastic. And then they, you know, they fought, you know, almost hundreds of times. But um, all all around the way, you know, the skills that Ali had and and the way that he was able to to fight over such a long period of time yeah there's not many but uh, joe lewis would be close and and marciano i'd say but i think people take into account all of the other things that happened in his life as well when they're looking at how good he was not just you know his boxing career when they call him the goat but the goat question in boxing is just it's it's, anson will tell you unfortunately he had a few technical problems um coming on the on the podcast today but anson will tell you that anson's um part of the WBC ratings committee, which rates for that belt, you know, who gets who gets chosen to fight the champion and, and that sort of thing. And he's also part of the ring ratings panel. So so really the 
the ring magazine they've got a sort of a, a combined list if you like apart from all the belts and everybody really goes to that ring list as to who's in that top 10 and um there was a big fight uh, last weekend. I'm not sure if you caught it. Was it Tiafimo Lopez beat Vasin Lomachenko to become the unified um, champion at lightweight? And look, that brought Lopez into the top 10 list and dropped Lopez down and sort of rejigged the, the top 10 list. And on on Twitter, the arguments about, about just that are incredible. So people are always <laughs> arguing about... About who is the greatest? Is it Ali? You know, is it Lewis? Is it Liston? You know, just for the heavyweights, you yeah, know, and then go in, you know, including then other weights, you know, Julio Cesar Chavez, Roberto Duran, Sugar Ray Leonard, Thomas Hearns. You know, they will they'll argue all day. To be honest, there's more arguments or discussion, shall we call it, around boxing than there are probably the other sports. What kind of an argument can be made for anybody except Ali being the GOAT heavyweight? I think the fact that Marciano was undefeated is probably the best argument for anybody else. Nobody else, everybody else lost the title. Although I, as I think about it, it's possible, and, and I could look this up real quick, it's possible that Lewis... Uh, I think Lewis retired and then later came back and fought more. So Lewis technically was not not defeated for the title, but Lewis also lost fights prior to winning the title. And then after he won it and retired, sorry, after he won the title and then fought several times, defended it, he then retired, later came back and then lost subsequent fights. But Marciano was the only one who... Started off undefeated, won the title when he was undefeated, retired when he was undefeated, and then never came out of retirement to lose subsequent fights. So I think if you're going to make an argument for anybody else, if you're just talking about heavyweight champions and you're not talking about the other weight classes, you're not talking about anybody who didn't have the title or anything like that, I think Marciano is probably the only other one you could make – an argument for and the only other one I would say would maybe be Frazier because he beat Ali and also fought and beat some of the others that Ali fought in that great golden age of heavyweight fighting in the 60s and 70s. But if you sort of made me come up with a number two, I think it would have to be Marciano Lewis fought some fought some good fighters, but also fought a lot of guys that were in the bum of the month club, as they called it. <laughs> And Marciano fought some guys who aren't that great either. But other than Ali, if I had to choose one, because he was undefeated, I would say Marciano. And hey, even Ali himself weighed in on this question. During Ali's 1970 appearance on Michael Parkinson's show on BBC, from which some samples appear in this episode of Truly the Goats, the host asked the self-proclaimed greatest, the question upon which Warner had crafted his original tournament three years previously, and Ali had sued over the answer will probably surprise you. People talk about this in sport all the time. They, they say, well, Dempsey was a great heavyweight and Louis he was a great heavyweight. And they're always talking about, you know, could they beat the, the, the present champion? Are you able to say, do you, do you think with any amount of certainty, how you might have managed against some of the great ones in the past? I know it's only a game that people play, but what do you feel? Well, I can't really say. It's up to people to pick. Like, like Joe Lewis was one of the greatest fist fighters. He didn't have the footwork, but he would take his time and he had sharp, hard punches. And Dempsey was a more of a wild, rough fighter, a little like Marciano, and he he was good. Marciano was the best slugger, I would say street fighter. Yeah. And Jack Johnson had his awkward, great boxing style. Gene Tooney was great. All of them. Tony Galento was a little heavy set fella who hit real hard to the body. I have my style of moving and dancing and whatever I do. So as you, what you'll have to do is to take all of the fighters, take me, take all of them, and then you just rank me where you want them. So I can't tell you. Truly the Goats is supposed to be a sports history podcast with perspective. That's the way I advertise it. And on this show, I do try to be as objective as possible in determining goatness of one athlete or another. But sometimes it's like the LeBron versus Jordan debate. Produce whatever stats and advanced metrics you like. Produce whatever numbers you want to throw at me. Run 1,000, 10,000 
computer simulations. Take a poll of former players. You'll probably never convince me. Because I was there. And for those of us who saw Ali in his prime when he said, I am the greatest. Many of us believed without question. I, for one, still do. Ali was the greatest. This has been the Truly the Goat Sports History Podcast, an inclusive medium production. Visit us online at trulythegoats.com and on Facebook and Twitter at Truly the Goats. Truly the Goats is also a member of the Sports History Network. Check out sportshistorynetwork.com, headquarters of sports yesteryear, for more like-minded podcasts. Music used in this episode of Truly the Goats includes Muhammad Ali by Prolete R and Holding Steady by Poddington Bear. Both tracks are available at freemusicarchive.org. Our theme song is Fun on Street, greatest remix of all time, and is produced by David Liso of Dynamo Stairs. Truly the Goats thanks our guests on this episode, Simon Walters of the You Don't Play Boxing podcast, which is available through Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and other podcast aggregators, and Dan Newman of the Hello Old Sports podcast, which is available through aggregators and at sportshistorynetwork.com. This is Oz Davis for Truly the Goats and Inclusive Media. Thanks for listening. Stay healthy out there. I think I've ever said this before, but I'll tell you. I really care nothing about boxing. Boxing is a stepping stone just to introduce me to the audience. Like, if I was still in Louisville, Kentucky and never was a boxer, I might get killed next week in some type of little freedom struggle and you never read the news. But now, if I'm even say the wrong thing and make news. So, like, boxing is just to introduce me to the struggle. At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of unique Unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876, including t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, phone cases, mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com, R-O-W number one, for access to the full Row 1 catalog and for gallery prints and gift items, plus get a 15% discount off all prints on the Row 1 Pictorum Gallery with coupon code SHN15. Follow the link on the show notes.